so much for having me here. And this is the first time I've been to this part of the world, and it's stunningly beautiful here. I, I, I cannot impress upon you strongly enough how much you need to fiercely oppose fracking. You do not want that to happen here. And I'm going to try to give you some experiences I've had and some things that we've done. By the time we caught on to what was happening, it was too far advanced. And I have a picture on my phone I can show you all later. Um, it, it looks like a million little pockmarks everywhere. It's just, it's everywhere. Um, so I just want to tell you how, how much you need to get very seriously and very fiercely opposed fracking. And I want to thank Friends of the Earth for bringing me over here. And I mean, it was, it was a Herculean effort. And, and Henry here is like the god of, of logistics because he put all these pieces. And I don't think that's how he wants to be known, really. But um, still, <laughs> he's, he did a, a, an amazing job of making everything fit, including when we realized that I was leaving the United States on the 4th, but I would not be here on the 4th. I wouldn't be here till the 5th. So we lost a whole day in planning. So I'm gonna, I have a lot to tell you. I think I've probably got over my time limit, but I really wanna tell you all this stuff. So I'm gonna jump in here. And I'm gonna, I, I've got some notes here, so I need to be able to look at this. But um, I think I... Okay, so this is me. And I am a fifth generation Texan, which I'm not sure how that happened. I think I fell out of a satellite, but... Um, I grew up on a horse, and um, that's all I ever wanted to do was ride my horses. And I did go to work for the oil and gas industry when I became an adult because that's what everybody in Texas does. And they pay a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money. But there's a reason they pay people that much money, and that is so they can buy your silence and they can buy your loyalty. But after about 12 years, I, I started catching on to things that I found very object objectionable, like the what I consider a lack of ethics and a disturbing sense of entitlement. So if I thought of this idea, I don't care who it hurts, you're stupid for getting in the way, I'm entitled to profit. And that's the mentality that, that you're dealing with. So... Um, as I, I left the oil and gas industry and I moved out to a place called Wise County. It's about 60 miles from Fort Worth. Fort Worth and Dallas are right together. And I bought 42 acres. It was beautiful. I could walk out my gate and be standing on national grassland property. Uh, 20,000 acres of national grassland property surrounded me. It was just a beautiful property. And all of a sudden, I started seeing these drilling rigs pop up everywhere. And I didn't realize that Wise County was where, and that's W-I-S-E, um, that's where George Mitchell, the father of fracking, the modern fracking, was learning how to frack. And so he did that all around me. And as I would watch it, I would think, that can't be right. Somebody needs to know they're doing this because they'll make them do it better. And I kept thinking that there was a better, that regulation, you know, would help. So I would call the um, regulators and, you know, that they weren't much help. And eventually, I even wrote a report called Drill Right, Texas. This is how you can drill right in Texas. If you do these things, you can drill right. It was so wrong. I can't even tell you how wrong and stupid that report was because they, they, first of all, they can't do those things. They won't do those things. There's nobody who can make them do those things, and it's not enough. There's not any, there's no such thing currently as being able to do fracking and this kind of unconventional oil and gas development right. It currently, it, it can't, and regulations just 
are not adequate. I don't, I don't care what they are. Now, the stoplight thing on the, on the earthquakes, that's pretty awesome. So, um, let's see where I am here. So this is eventually, um, it became, eventually my air turned brown and my water turned black. And so I felt like I could not live there anymore and I couldn't subject my young son to the kind of um, pollution that he was breathing, the things that I was seeing. So um, I moved to Denton, Texas. Does anybody know the story of Denton, Texas? That was like jumping out of the frying pan right into the fire. But I'll get to that later. So um, eventually I um, went to work for Earthworks and we help people who are impacted by extraction in industries. And what that means is I help people for a living. And there's no better way. That's the best job you could ever have. And I'm so happy with what I do. And so next slide. So here's, here's one of the things that y'all don't have that happened to us. We have what's called a split estate. So you can buy a piece of property and you think you own that property. And no one tells you this when you go to close on that property and give them your money. You only, you may only own from here, from the ground up. Someone else may own all of the minerals. Like here, the crown owns the minerals. But over there, some individual or a family could own the minerals. And the mineral estate has a priority over the surface estate. So basically, if, um, if the mineral owner wants to develop their minerals, and it means putting a drill rig in your backyard, too bad. You were stupid for buying it is their reaction, although no one, no one told you that. People are finally starting to catch on. But that's one thing that happened to us that has made it much harder because Individuals here, like a farmer, if they put, if they put a, drill, a drill site on their place, they may pay them some money, but it's nothing like what they get for owning the minerals. And so it made, it put pitted neighbor against neighbor, and the mineral owners uh, really fought, and it's my right, it's my property, even though most of them didn't even work for it, they inherited it, but um, that's, that's what happened to us. So here's another thing that happened to us. And this is non-disclosure agreements. You probably have those here too. But what happens is the industry and our government say there's no proof. There is no proof that water has ever been contaminated by fracking. There is no proof. You can't prove that this pollution from this well made you sick. You can't prove that that's what it was. So landowners take all the money they've got, they're stuck, they're here on their land, they're paying their mortgage, they can't get out, and so they take all the money they've got and they hire scientists to come and prove it. And they get these studies and they prove it. And then the industry comes along with a, not, with a settlement. Okay, we're gonna give you this much money and you can move away, but you can never talk about it again. It comes with a gag. So, they, so all that science and all that proof that they got right here, that disappears. It's hidden forever behind a non-disclosure agreement. Our lawmakers cannot see it. Scientists cannot see it. The media cannot see it. No one can ever see it, and they cannot ever speak about it again. So that has allowed our, the industry and our government to say there is no proof, even though there's ample proof, but it's all been hidden. So now I'm going to tell you about some stories about people that this has happened to. This is looking out a ki the kitchen window of Tim and Christine Ruggiero. And they had 10, 10 and a half beautiful acres that they bought for their daughter to raise animals they had horses, and one day their neighbor called them and um, they said, they're bulldozing your property, they cut your fence down, and your horses are running wild. And this happened, they got no notice. Um, I'm just gonna look at my notes here. They got no notice, um, and they called me, 
and said, what do I do, what do I do? So I told him, and this is the key, get a baseline water test right now. Now, it was very early on. This was in 2009. So I didn't know at the time to tell them that they needed to also do baseline air testing. But they did get a baseline water test. And that is, that is key because the baseline testing is the oil and gas industry's kryptonite. And so they were given no notice, they had no say, because they didn't know that they didn't own their minerals. They had, I'm just going to read my notes here. I don't know how to make it go down. Their water wells. So eventually they had, um, they were exposed to constant emissions, very high, very high emissions, pollution from the tanks and from this that made them sick. They got nosebleeds, they got rashes, their daughter came down with asthma. She, she was an athlete, very young. She was, I think, eight. And she came down with asthma. Um, they had six spills on their property. But the industry, of course, tried to, to cover this up. So you would see them out very early in the morning when it was 14 degrees shoveling gravel, like they were putting new gravel on the site. But what they were doing is covering up the spill that had happened overnight. Um, their water well was contaminated. They had, um, is this a microphone? Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, they, they uh, took the baseline test and then after fracking, they took a follow-up test and they sent it off to the lab and the lab called them. Instead of just mailing them the results, they called them and said, do not use your water for anything. It is unfit to use for any purpose. If you have a fire, do not use your water to put out the fire. It will make it worse. <laughs> so um, their property value loss was 70%. And realtors told them, I couldn't in good conscience sell this property for any amount. So um, just click. So yeah, so you saw the drill rig right outside their window. This is a sign on their drill site. Danger, do not enter. Tank may contain fatal vapors. So the best you can ever get is when you catch industry telling the truth. This is industry telling the truth. And that was right where their daughter used to play. So the next, the next slide, this is their property. Here's their house. And this is where the drill site was. Um, so go to the next slide. This shows it. This shows an outline of their property and where the drill site was. Now go back. So this is, this right here is the waste pit where they spread the waste pit and they spread it out all over, all on the land. It's called land, they call it land farming. It sounds like a good thing, right? That's what they do in the United States with the land. With the waste, they spread it on the land. Toxic chemicals, radioactive material, heavy metals. So, and this is their barn, and that's their house. So they worked with me. They learned how to, um, and I, I learned with them, we learned how to document everything using the state's own data a lot of times because one of the keys is to complain. And I don't know about in the English people, but um, Texans, they're real stoic. They never want to complain. They don't want, you know, they might call and say there's an odor, but they don't tell people it's making them sick. And because they don't want to admit that they're sick from, because they're tough. So the key, one of the keys to this industry, complain. All the time, complain. Complain to the regula regulatory agency, just complain a lot. Because eventually, they were, we were able to get enough data to, t uh, they sued the company, and the company now, no one is gonna buy that place. They, they spread all the waste here. This has been like 2010. It still looks like that. They've seeded it with grass four or five times. Grass will, will never grow there. So that house, 
now is a beautiful house. It, was, it now is an office for the industry people. And, but at least the Ruggiero family got out. So next slide, let's see what's next. Yeah, the next one. Oh, yeah. This is their property, there's their house. This is the waste, that, and, and it's horrible. That It just reeks. You can see the oil slicks here. You can see all the spills around the site. And this, you can see the oil. This is gelatinous in the waste pit. That's what they spread on their land. And then here is driving up to their houses behind that. This was constant diesel emissions like that. Okay, next, next story. This is a case study from Argyle and Bartonville, Texas. It's, um, one of the Forbes magazines said it was one of the top five or ten places to live in the United States. And so it was a fairly affluent community. And they plopped down this facility. It was a, it's a mini processing plant. It had a compressor station and compressor stations really are horrible. They put out a lot of pollution. They just plopped this down right in the middle of this neighborhood, very, a small rural neighborhood, and the, the facility, the, the fence for the facility was about 15 feet from one kid's bedroom window. And so um, this, this community got very organized. They were smart. They had a little bit of money. They were able to do some baseline testing. They worked really hard and it paid off. Um, so go to the next slide. This, they had, um, in this facility had 501 emission events in one year. These are the chemicals that the state tested. Wasn't our independent testing, this is the state you know, the state tries to cover stuff up. These are the chemicals from one event, one of the 501 events. These families had to get their children, their pets, and evacuate in the middle of the night many, many times and go, go stay somewhere else because they could not stay at home. Um, so, yeah, next slide. Um, when they would have an event, they got so organized, when they would have an event, when they would smell an, an odor, they would call each other and report their physical sy symptoms they were having. This is key because all of these symptoms, this is from that same event. They would call them and they would have a scribe who kept all of the, a record of all of the, the health symptoms they were having. From that one event, these were the health impacts. And these health impacts, if you look up the chemicals on the slide before, you will see that those chemicals cause these health impacts. It's a match. Sharon, you say that the chemicals found were found by state testing. Did the state not feel that they had some responsibility, having found those chemicals, to protect the residents? To stop um, the old companies doing it? Well, <laughs> was that a naive question? They, ha they have they <clears throat> have a mission statement, and their mission statement says something like, "We want to protect our big priority is to protect the health of the public, in an in an industry friend business friendly environment." Mm -hmm. So this was, when, this was when fracking just first started, and the Barnett Shell is where it started. It just started, and the regulatory agencies, they didn't know what to do because they would, um, you know, we would call and make a complaint, and they would come out and do air testing, and they would find stuff. And they were, you know, that was not good. And so what happened is they tried to not come until, you know, two or three days later. And then they would show up, and of course they didn't find anything. And and it's just um, they try not to they ju they just try not to find any problems. So then we have to do our own testing, but they won't. They say they don't accept it because 
they can't verify if it was done scientifically or, or some dumb thing like that. Let me see first before you. Um, okay, I said that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just I, I want to stress on you how important it is to work together, like um, a bit, like that community did, because the oil and gas industry will say, and they will do anything. Mm -hmm. They will say anything. They come up with the most bizarre things to say. They will try to tear communities apart. They will pit neighbor against neighbor and try to make you do, uh, do infighting in your groups. Just don't. I mean, if you do have infighting and there's going to be arguments, settle it quietly. Don't let it become something that's known outside because the industry will use, they'll see that as a weakness and they'll use it. So I told you the Argyle Bartonville community did baseline testing and when they did their baseline testing they found seven of the 84 chemicals that TCEQ tests for. So there's, it's not too bad. You know, there's going to be stuff in the air. Um, and they already had a little bit of fracking so it wasn't a true baseline. Follow-up testing, 65 detects on the lot where the high school band practices. So parents, and, and it was 2,640 2, feet from the facility. So that's te that tells you that is not an adequate setback. Nowhere do they have that kind of a setback. I mean, they, you know, they, you can't get far enough away. And I can tell you more about that, but, um, the, the parents would take their kids to band practice and drop them off in a mist of hydrocarbons. And then their kids would get sick. And so the, the main problem, so the, the state might test, come out and do air testing, but none of the chemicals would be super high. Maybe one or two would exceed the state recommended level, but they wouldn't be super high. But the problem is the mixture. You mix a cocktail of these chemicals together, and then it becomes a different thing. It's Frankenstein. So the presence of one agent can increase the toxicity of another agent by several fold. So a chemical that they never see in the brain binds with the chemical that they do see in the brain, and then you've got two chemicals in the brain. And if you look up David R. Brown, toxicology, on YouTube and watch all of his uh, YouTube videos. He's really great. So what I do when I'm talking to a group of people, are there any doctors here? Any physicians? So if there are, I would ask the next, this next question, which is, what is the increased risk when chemical exposure to our children intensifies from seven chemicals to a cocktail of 65 chemicals? No one can answer that. Because that science is just starting to happen. They don't know the answer to that, yet they are putting these facilities right in people's backyards. Next story is Denton, Texas. Does anybody, has anybody heard about Denton? We were the first, so I moved to Denton, ran right in, I was unpacking, they started fracking in a, across the street from a park. So um, Denton was the first city in Texas to ban fracking. And they didn't um, come by that decision um, easily because it's Texas. And they felt like, well, we use hydrocarbons, so we need to bear part of the burden. And all of these, all of these things, which is, you know, whatever. But this is how close, you can see how close that they were drilling when uh, Denton finally said, okay, that's enough. This is a site right here. They're building a new house. That house has somebody living in it now. These are tanks. That tank, that, that's a vent to vent hydrocarbons. Um, this is, lightning loves oil and gas facilities. It strikes all the time. This is a lightning strike that started a big fire. Look, look at the house right there. That was in Denton. They had a blowout. This is the park where they were drilling across the street from the park. This is a sweet little boy who, after they drilled that well, had nosebleeds 
multiple times every day. Never had nosebleeds before. 20% of the people who live near um, oil and gas have nosebleeds. That's unreal statistic just when you look at the regular company and uh, the regular population. And that statistics comes from David Brown, toxicologist. Um, so we decided, ultimately we decided to ban fracking. So go to the next slide. So this is, this is why we decided, we would go to the city government and we'd say, we need some better <coughs> regulations, we need a better city ordinance, we need better setback, and the city government would say, our hands are tied, there's nothing we can do. The industry will sue us. We're just a small town. We can't afford to get sued. Blah, blah, blah. So they said, you have to go to the state government. So we went to the state. And the state said, this is Texas. We, we like local control. We want you to settle your stuff locally. So you need to go back to the city. And this is a local issue. And we support local government. So we went back to the city all the time. Everything's going on. And by that time, there were 300 wells inside the city limits, and Denton is a small town. It's 20,000 people, 300 wells. So we decided to ban fracking, so next slide. And that was our logo, Frack Free Denton. We kept it very local. This is, that's the courthouse um, in the back and the courthouse steps and the benches. Everybody goes and sits up on the courthouse. It's a gathering place. We kept it very local. Um, our message was really tight. We had great t-shirts, and I meant to wear mine tonight, but go to the next slide. And this is what we did. We, we, we were able to gather enough yeah. signatures to get the decision put on the ballot, to get the um, ban put on the ballot. And so we had puppet shows and very talented um, musicians and artists and um, creative people got together and we had these fabulous puppet shows and there was always the guy with the mustache and he was the oil and gas man. We had the frackettes. Have y'all seen, anybody yeah. seen the frackettes? Yeah. And they would take songs like Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend and turn it into fracking. <coughs> Girl's Best Friend. Um, so this is Tara Lynn, and she was the head of the volunteer, she was a volunteer coordinator. She helped all the, um, kept up with all the volunteers. We knocked on every single door in Denton, Texas, at least once. That's another key. Nobody wants to knock on their neighbor's door. Knock on your neighbor's door. Um, we had these fabulous yard signs. We had two billboards two beautiful billboards. Um, we kept our message very local. Our air, our water, our health and safety, our Denton. That was it. You know, ban fracking in the city limits. This was a, a Fourth of July parade, and everybody, we had a mock drilling rig we were pulling, and the whole, everybody just went wild. So, I don't know, with 60% uh, of the vote, we banned fracking in a Republican town. It's a very Republican conservative town. They agreed. I mean, these guys would drive up in these big pickup, you know, two, I mean, four wheels just on the back. And I, and I was standing at the polls, you know, to give people information. I was like, I'm not talking to that guy. No, I'm scared of him. But I just, I told myself, I'm gonna talk to every person. So. I would go up to somebody like this and say, do you know about the frac fracking ban? Yes, I do. Well, do you know how you're going to vote? Yes, I know how I'm going to vote. Well, you know, it's, it's a little bit deceptive the way they have it on the ballot. Yeah, I looked into it. And he said, I'm going to tell you what, fracking does not belong in the city limits. I was like, God, all right. <laughs> so, I mean, I, the, there was a woman who even said the most racist, unbelievable things you can think of about Obama. And she said, but I'm voting against that. I'm voting for that fracking ban. It was just, it was unreal because when you keep it very local and about your health, your safety, your children, your families, then it, res it really resonates with people. They want to protect what they have. But we live in Texas. The next morning after the ban passed and we were 
all just, you know, hung over and happy and just celebrating. The very next morning, early, the state of Texas and the oil and gas industry sued the city of Denton. But we didn't have to worry about um, the lawsuit because the Texas legislature, the oil and gas industry showered money on the Texas legislature. They just stuffed their ears full of money and they could not hear us. And so they passed a new law that said you cannot ban fracking, no city can ban fracking, and they stripped away almost every bit of any regulatory, uh, anything that you can do for a city to regulate fracking. And th there's four tests, but this is what, number three, must not effectively prevent an oil and gas operation from occurring. Pretty much means whatever you do, you're screwed. And they said, you know, it has to be commercially reasonable. If you, if you pass a law, it has to be commercially reasonable. And the standard was a prudent operator. So the next slide will show you what they think a prudent operator is. This is Devon Energy, drilled right here in a Denton County um, city and that this is what the Texas legislature thinks is commercially reasonable. So they kicked our teeth in, but next slide. So we're, we're like, what now? So we, we've decided we have a bunch of lawyers. We can bring a constitutional challenge if we find a city that, that has the courage to um, stand up to the oil and gas industry, which is not easy to find, or we can pass legislation that will increase local control. So we have to chip away with it a little bit at a time. So we decided to organize, and Earthworks did a bunch of fundraising, and next slide. We got together, brought people in from all over Texas, a very diverse group, and we started the Texas Grassroots Network, and we're going, the first stab was in 2015, we had a bill, but we have another bill. It didn't go anywhere because we didn't organize this group early enough. So we have another bill. We know it's not going to pass, but we hope we can get a hearing so that we can get the impacts and the health impacts on uh, record. So this is organized. This is what we did. And next slide. So that's my experience with fracking. Um, it, it took everything for me. I lived on 42 acres. I had horses. I had a garden. I had hobbies. I kind of remember hobbies. Um, and now I live in a condo. I travel all the time. I hate, I hate to travel. I really hate traveling. But I travel all the time because it's very important. And now if I have time, I don't know if I have time. Have I run out of time? No. I want to tell you all about methane because I know from talking to people since I've been here, you don't know this. You need to know this. Natural gas is methane. I say methane, you say methane. I'm going to mispronounce everything. And y'all are too polite <laughs> to say anything about it. But, um, you know, it's been presented as a bridge fuel. So the public's very confused, and it's so important to get this message out. It does burn cleaner, about 40% cleaner. That's not clean enough. But that's just when you get it to wherever it generates the electricity. That's not all the way down the line from when they clear the pad. So due to the leaks and venting, it's actually worse for climate than coal. And all of the all of the studies will say come out with different numbers, 1.5 leak rate, 3.2 leak rate, a 15%. This is playing Russian roulette with our children's future. We don't know what the leak rate is because it's not metered. The way they get their the leak rate is they do these studies above and below, but it's not metered. And where some of the numbers come from is from the EPA, and where the EPA gets their numbers is from the industry. So they go ask the industry, how much are you leaking? Oh, well, I'm uh, not much, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, the more important thing to know, global warming potential. This is like the most important thing you can know about methane. The global warming potential of CO2 is one. The global warming potential of methane is over 100. 
So it is 100 times more potent at warming our planet than CO2. So every, the scientists all talk about CO2. I don't know why they don't talk about methane more, but I'm going to make them. I'm going to figure out a way to make them talk because climate change is a big topic right now because it's accelerated way beyond the modeling where we thought it would be. And so, um, it, you know, it's heated up things a lot faster. And according to NASA 2018, and maybe that's on my next slide, yeah. So NASA 2018, the methane spike correlates to the fracking boom. That's when it started, 2006 is when the methane started spiking and it's gone up ever since that year. So it correlates to the fracking boom and guess what folks? It's not cows. 68% of the global methane spike is from oil and gas, and that's per NASA. And so it's not cows. I mean, cows are a problem, but the problem is fracking and methane from oil and gas. So what's the next slide? So the hope lies in stopping fracking. So if we stop fracking, and this is per Robert Howarth, who is a scientist, and Tony and Graffia, I don't know if y'all watch him. So that, um, Bob Howarth and Tony and Graffi are the first ones to look at methane from unconventional shale and decide what it was doing in our climate. They're the first ones. That was in 2011. The fracking boom started in 2006, so that's a little bit late. We're getting in on this late. But because it comes into the climate so hot and it only sticks around about 12 years, so that means if we stop fracking now, it will buy us some time. The planet will immediately have a response and begin to cool. And then, next slide. This is, so this is what, um, and, and uh, Friends of the Earth has this presentation so they can make the slides available to you. But this is the camera that I use because seeing is believing and I nagged Earthworks for two years to get them to fundraise and get me this camera because it, it was so important because people would know that they were getting sick, they were smelling odors, but you could not see it, it's invisible. So the industry would go, well, me? Mm -hmm. We didn't do it. And they'd say, it's your candles, it's the cleaning products you're using, just, you'll say anything. And so that's when we got the camera and I went to a class, it was very hard, uh, three days, and I got certified in a room, a huge room, about twice this big, full of oil industry people. It was the only non-industry person there. And let me tell you, they did tell some stories and they weren't pretty about things that happened, you know, with fracking and with emissions and all that. So let's see what's next. Um, so this camera that I have was put in the Federal Register and it is, it's not just a camera, it's an instrument. The instrument has the ability to um, record the video, but the camera itself is an instrument and it is a, an optical gas imaging instrument and it, it makes visible the invisible. Pretty cool, huh? I can make the invisible visible. And um, so it's, it's a legal way to detect oil and gas emissions. The camera was designed to detect oil and gas emissions and the oil and gas industry will make all kinds of statements like, I don't know what I'm doing, she doesn't know what she's doing, and that's not really what you're seeing, that's not really that. But um, I was trained by the same people that train them. But they just look at their own facilities. I look at facilities everywhere. Now I can say I've been all over the United States and other countries, and, and I see the same thing. I consistently <coughs> find emissions. Next slide. And this is how it, this is how it uh, does, in case y'all just want to know, um, it's, it's very narrowly calibrated to pick up hydrocarbons. That's the purpose of the camera, is to pick up hydrocarbons. And hydro hydrocarbons absorb infrared light in a very narrow spectrum, just, I mean, just very narrow, right there, just that much. So it's very finely tuned. And so the hydrocarbons pick up the infrared and they become opaque. And then you can, you can see it, the camera shows them to us. And that's how it does that. What's next? 
So when you look at a site, this is a site in Texas. So this is what you see, that's the flare. That's a flare pipe right there. Next slide. This is what the camera shows us. The flare pipe is not lit. You can't see whether it's lit or not with the naked eye. And those are hydrocarbons, methane, volatile organic compounds coming out. So, in case you don't know about this site, this is the solution. We, we already have everything we need right now to fix this problem, and that's using wind, solar, and hydro. We don't need nuclear. We go to the solutions project, and you can read about all the solutions that are ready right now. I just got an electric car. Yay! <laughs> Great. So, and if you want to get in touch with me, um, you can feel free, next slide, to contact me and follow me on Twitter. It's just Texas TX Sharon. I'm really mouthy on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and so now I'll, I'm through. I'll take Thank it. Thank you.